on behalf of the National Policies and Strategies Research, CGIR Research Initiative, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this really exciting uh, meeting that we're going to have, and we'll talk about that in a second. My name's Michael Victor. I'm the Head of Communications and Knowledge Management at the International Livestock Research Institute and also supporting uh, this research initiative on kind of knowledge management for policy engagement. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Just some really tips before you we get on, please. Uh, you know, do not use your built-in microphone, use uh, headsets if you can. Uh, put your full name uh, and organization into uh, on, your, on your name so people know where you're from. Uh, please keep your microphone off at all times unless you're speaking. Uh, if you cannot hear or see or there's some problems, it's always easy to restart Zoom and, and go again. We're really going to be using the chat throughout this session and we'll, we'll be having some chat falls and we really wanna start the conversation on the chat. We're not going during presentations, we're not gonna have questions and answer, but if you have questions you want to ask, do it on the chat and the presenters or someone else will respond on the chat. Uh, and uh, lastly, the session is recorded. So uh, just to let everybody know and that there will be potentially some live tweeting. So just people, so people are aware. Uh, so today, again, we're really excited. I think uh, the National uh, Policies and Strategies Research Initiative is working in six countries, and its you know, core element is to really build stronger policies with greater coherence and helping countries address current crises and future needs. Uh, and we see one way of doing this is communities of policy practice. Uh, and we see for us, you know, in the six countries that we're working, this is all very emergent. We're not gonna be presenting great technical details right now or lessons learned. This is really the start of the conversation and we really wanna build up a community of people who are working on policy engagement at the, uh, uh, you know, at the national level. So this is really an opportunity to crowdsource ideas and learn from, from all of you as well. And so we've, we've really hopefully structured the, uh, structured the agenda in that way. Uh, so we're gonna have a quick introduction and we'll, we'll kind of learn from people right off the bat. We'll have some uh, uh, quick kind of chat falls. Then we'll have a kind of a framing presentation from Alan Nickel. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, a presentation on an example of one of these emerging communities of policy practice from Egypt. Uh, we also have an emerging, really something very interesting we found is, you know, how to get the youth involved and the next generation into policy research and engagement. So we have a presentation on policy hackathons. Uh, and then we'll have a, a, a panel discussion with some partners uh, who are actually starting, your, who, are, who are involved in the communities of policy practice in some of the countries that we're working in. And then some reflections and comments uh, from some real experts, uh, Godfrey uh, Bagiwa uh, and Enrique uh, Mendizabal. So, and then we'll have some wrap up and reflections. So we have a great session uh, really planned. Just as a warm up, uh, we have a couple of questions to ask. So the first question we want to ask is, and don't, don't type it in right now, and then uh, press return in a couple, like 30 seconds. I'll tell everybody when they can press return and put it on. But the first question is, why are you interested in this side event? We're interested to hear why you're interested. So just type down your response in the chat, but don't press return yet, okay? And we'll wait till everybody's ready and then see all the range of responses that come up. So just think for 30 seconds, why are you interested in this event and type it into the chat. Okay, you can press return now. Let's see if, if you finish press return. So we have people who are working in CGIR. People want to understand how policymakers are thinking, the concept of the community practice and strategy. A lot of people working on, on this area in their different respective fields. Food sustainability, working on food systems. 
Interested to see, that's good to see, Kenny, how it's going to work in your, your context. That's great. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, excellent. Uh, I'm touched, want to know more. So yeah, again, a lot of learning. People want to know what's going to happen in their country, want to learn because they're working on engagement as well. So one other question we have, uh, just from your own experience, what, what lesson can you bring into this conversation on not national policy platforms and national engagement? What's one lesson? What's one expertise you bring in? Uh, so again, just spend 30 seconds. Uh, 30 seconds, write down, what, what's one good lesson that you have to share right now? Don't press return yet. Okay, press return when you, uh, if you have a lesson you want to share. Interesting, collective thinking is far better than collection of individual thinking. That's a nice one. I like that. That's a quote we might have to use. That's a good, nice one. Experience of doing policy research in India from Vanessa and uh, data, a data initiative. Data suppliers sometimes need better understand what policymakers have. That's a really interesting lesson. Uh, Public-private partnerships. We've heard about civil society as well from Ganesh. Uh, we have we have some great people who are experienced in policy making. Uh, social learning, great. So we have a lot of great experience here. That's really interesting to see. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Did someone put policies are never ending? That's definitely true. Uh, yeah. yeah. Ah, excellent. Policies during climate change. Okay, excellent. So this is really good. Keep on putting in your uh, comments and questions. We really want to use the chat as much as we can. So if you have questions or comments, put them into the chat. Uh, so with that, I'm going. To, we're going to move on. We're going to have a framing presentation uh, from Alan Nichol. Just turn around for one second. Uh, and uh, Alan is the uh, uh, and a Alan is kind of the co-lead. He is the the co-lead for the the MPS initiative, and also working at uh, Emmy as well. So I hand it over to uh, Alan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, hi everyone. It's it's really exciting to have you all online and to be uh, engaging in this debate and this conversation. I think the two words I put in are listening and learning, because I think, you know, in any policy process or any construction of a, of a, a community of policy practice, those are, those are key, certainly for me, and this is part of it. So having this breadth of participation on such an important part of our work is, is exciting. So welcome. Um, I co-lead this uh, National Policies and Strategies um, initiative. The full title is for Food, Land and Water Systems Transformation. So yeah, next slide, please, Michael. Um, it's important to understand that it's, its context within the CGIR is part of this, this set of initiatives under the Systems Transformation Science Group. So under the CGIR Strategy 2030, the, the focus is really on, on integrating the, um, the different science areas, the understandings, the impact areas that we're trying to work on, the five impact areas there are the petals in the sense of the, the diagram you see, and the National Policies and Strategies uh, Initiative is, is at the heart of this, trying to tie together very diverse policy areas and trying to understand, in, in essence, how to build coherence across climate change mitigation, poverty reduction, environmental health, nutrition, gender equality, and social inclusion. So it's a, a huge task to 
to consider. Many countries have very siloed policy environments um, and institutions that can work quite independently in constructing policy. So thinking through the policy environments, mapping those policy environments, understanding them is very much part of the, the initiative and part of how we want to take forward our work with, with the likes of you online. Next slide, please. So we focus on three core areas. One is this built this notion of building policy coherence. So really strengthening it at a national level, but also we have to be cognizant of the fact that there are 30 something initiatives working out there in many different countries in six regions of the world. So we need to be very clear about how internally as well, we can build coherence across those initiatives and how they engage in policy environments. It's not just about working with national partners, it's also about working with our own sister initiatives and trying to strengthen that coherence. We're also considering how to integrate policy tools in these policy processes. So how do you improve the structure of those tools? How do you improve their engagement in different institutional contexts, nationally or subnationally, or even regionally? And how do you make sure that the outcomes of, of using those kinds of tools, whether they're CGIR tools or tools from other institutions, really lead to the kind of development outcomes that we need to see, particularly in terms of achieving SDGs. And then finally, you know, we live in an unstable and, and uh, complex world and responding to crises is, is a critical factor in our work. So these communities of policy practice are also to a greater or lesser extent trying to help build constituencies around crises responses. Think of the energy crisis, think of the food crisis, think of the rapidly increasing cost of living in many contexts. So the, the initiative is thinking about how it can build use value into these communities of policy practice uh, at the same time as building policy coherence and integrating policy tools. Michael. Thanks. We're working in these six countries Michael mentioned. And on the right hand side, the text is proportionate, the size of the text, to the number of initiatives in those countries. So here I am sitting in Kenya, in Nairobi, um, where 16 initiatives are working in, in a very diverse set of, of geographies and a very diverse set of policy arenas. So working to build coherence uh, across those different initiatives is critical. It's the country also, at the moment, in parts of the country suffering severe food crises. So there are lots of very important reasons why these communities of policy practice are important, um, how they can deliver important outcomes and effects in, in such circumstances. And these six countries are where we're building these communities of policy practice, but by no means do we think that's where they'll end as such, because we think that the, the approach is something that can be adopted and replicated elsewhere. Again, one of the reasons why we're very keen to hear your ideas, your suggestions, and your critiques of, of our approach to this. Next slide, please. But what does it mean supporting policy coherence and building these kinds of, of, of structures? I mean, there are different levels. So we've got to consider where and how in a different national context, in different national contexts we're working between national, regional and subnational, for example. We've also got to consider the need for some level of contestation and dialogue. And we all know policy processes are, are informed by different knowledge communities, different epistemologies. So we also have to consider the kinds of knowledge that, that is shared and is brought into these, um, these kinds of policy communities and these kinds of, of uh, communities of policy practice. And I saw in the chat, someone mentioned indigenous knowledge, which is incredibly important too. We also need to think about that heterogeneity and the political economy around it. So there are lots of issues there surrounding the kind of institutional environments and the ways in which um, actor stakeholder groups and interest groups can be either formally or informally engaged in policy processes, shaping them and therefore uh, delivering particular kinds of outcomes as, as policies are implemented. And above all, there's perhaps a need to think about this notion of multi-stakeholder platforms and involving a broad group of people, a broad group of organizations in, in policy construction. However, we also know the larger the group, the increased breadth, the more complex it, it becomes. So there are lots of trade-off issues here as well that I think we also need to look at. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do you do when you're thinking about defining a community of policy practice? I mean, essentially, these are our ideas going forward, but we wanna hear your, your thoughts on these. So defining a purpose, what does it do? Why should it exist? You know, indeed, what is the purpose is critical. 
what is the membership? Who forms the community? What kind of stakeholder engagement do you want to, to bring in? So how narrow or how broad is, is the, the community policy practice? And what kind of practice procedures do you want in place? That includes the organizing and, and operating principles, but also the overall governance mechanisms are key. So thinking about the formation, the implementation, but also the reviewing of how it's progressing. How is it actually achieving its targets and its milestones and then feeding that back into the design and thinking about how to improve it. Maybe through a sort of action research approach is also very important. Next slide, please. So we put together some principles essentially to start informing how we, um, we want to go about developing and establishing and supporting communities of policy practice in these six countries. And the first is really understanding what already exists. There's no point in, in duplicating, uh, reinventing the wheel. So identifying that, the, the landscape of the institutions and the policy constituencies involved, understanding that is really important. Um, building a, a coalition of the willing, for want of a better phrase perhaps, but those members of the community of policy practice should be self-selected and motivated to be part of it and really start sharing common understandings of how to work through these problems. It's essentially a kind of problem solving um, approach and fostering trust amongst members of the community of policy practice is also key. Central to which is transparency and understanding a shared sense of position with respect to policy challenges and processes. That doesn't necessarily mean everyone has to agree in, in, in a COP, but certainly understanding why they're there and what they're trying to achieve is, is important to have um, a common understanding of. Now, supporting from behind. So we're involved in this as national policies and strategies, but by no means leading. So a lead institution, either nationally or subnationally, and supporting from the back of the room is, is important to our approach. So really helping, but not, but not leading um, is, is key. These are national processes that need to be owned at that level. Starting light. So we've had some debates internally about this as well. How, how heavy should these structures be? How light, how dynamic, how res responsive should they be? Perhaps they need to be different in a different context. Almost certainly they do. There's no blueprint, but in ensuring there's a clear lead, there's organizational buy-in, and that they should be allowed to evolve in the directions that they need to evolve in is also key. So they need to be driven by that constituency involved in them. And that will be very much related to the context, the national context, the regional context in which they're situated but also diversity resourcing and breadth is key. So, so, you know, for instance, gender diversity or other issues of difference, other kinds of uh, intersectionalities need to be considered because developing policy or thinking through policy processes or responding to crises, all of it involves a kind of collective wisdom that we need to really be uh, aware of and, and encouraging and taking a knowledge sharing approach so that they're not sort of black boxes at all uh, or any kind of closed, hermetically sealed container, but they're also able to share what they're learning and to therefore foster innovation to speed up outcomes as well. Next slide, please. So that's all I wanted to say. There's a link to our, uh, our, our um, initiative online there, so you can find out more about what we're trying to do. And I really look forward to your deliberations, to the chat, keep the questions coming in, make them as hard as possible. And I thank you very much for your time. Back to you, Michael. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Alan. That's really a good framing. And again, if you have questions, comments, anything you strongly disagree with, uh, please put it into the chat. Uh, we'll also, Alan, if you could put the initiative uh, link into the chat, that would be great too. So we're, we're going to move on and go to the next uh, presentation, which really gives a framing and an example on the, you know, kind of on the ground example of what's happening. And we have uh, uh, Fatma Abdelaziz, who will be presenting on experiences from Egypt. She's the stakeholder engagement coordinator uh, for the Egypt program. So over to you, uh, Fatma. So thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. Um, so I want to refrain from also being redundant to what Alan already described. So Alan already gave an overview of what COP is, um, and I'll need to move on to the next point where I'm trying to explain. Again, as we mentioned earlier, it's mainly um, I would say effort in progress. We're trying to figure out how we can define COP within Egypt. So if we look for the very, very simplistic uh, definition that 
COPs are essentially platforms that facilitate ongoing public policy discourse. So our choice was basically to not build a new platform, but rather build upon what is already existing, as Alan mentioned. So maybe next slide. So our approach in Egypt was instead of reinventing the wheel, really just approach uh, is to try to structure or restructure some of the existing networks that we have and some of the existing groups. Again, a lot of these groups are already there. And there's a lot of consortiums of which I will give two examples to at, at least in this uh, presentation. So the first example is the uh, DPG or the Development Partners Group. I'm sure a lot of you have already heard about it. So it's a group of over 46 participants. And here I mean namely 46 or more actually institutions. Uh, they could be uh, international organizations, national organizations, government, what have you. In all cases, these development partners, as we say, they come together regularly with the objective of promoting effective development dialogue. And again, the idea here is to cooperate, to coordinate, to think, develop some sort of a think tank together to support national development. And they hold these meetings on different thematic and different thematic or different topics. Uh, at least some of the recent ones that were discussed were social protection, um, energy and environment, among others. Within IFPRI, we're mainly dealing with the DPG group, but the, the ARD arm or the agriculture donors group under DPG. So that's just an example, again, of an existing network that works or addresses a specific theme connecting different institutes. Another example would be, next slide, Michael, would be the regional network, um, would be the regional network of experts. So if any one of you looked it up, it's basically housed at the FAO. And here, I would say the main difference between it and the DPG group is that the DPG group is basically a consortium of institutions or organizations. Here, it's mainly a consortium of individuals. They, you do not have to be affiliated to a specific organization to join this group. And again, uh, they're housed at FAO, r &E, um, and mainly they're compromised. Uh, they're, they're basically composed of, an, of a group of, um, of experts from a variety of stakeholders in their individual capacity. So they're here intended to serve as to create this sort of, again, consortium of information or powerhouse to be able to lobby or to um, kind of involve in a, in a strict policy pathway with the government. But their specific thematic focus is uh, agriculture trade. So main, mainly a lot of their discussions are related to policies with regards to regional and multilateral trade agreements, um, the role of trade as an enabler of food security. So you'll find a lot of their meetings and topics are mainly with regards to agricultural trade, but it's another example of an embedded network that we can simply capitalize on. Um, next slide. So in an effort to bring things together and to try to sort of draw a big diagram of what we already have, maybe more or less we are building here on some of the contacts we already have through the GPG uh, agriculture donor groups. Uh, I would say ARM, these are some of the contacts we had that we said, okay, let's start drafting some network based on the networks we already have. So if you split that, you will see there's the policy decision levy inf level influence of which we have partners from the Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Social Solidarity, Ministry of Agriculture. And then we can look at some of the research partners that we can use. And here we, we thought of the Institute of National Planning, Cairo University, Egyptian Center for Economic Studies and so on. But without that, besides the ministry level, besides the research level, we also think that it's very important to coordinate the ongoing participants with regards to you have the key international organizations and you also have the national organizations and both of these are also existing arms in the GPG group and of course many of the if you, of the international organizations you see listed below here just give you an example of how many contacts there are and how and how, to what extent they're actually already connected so in our proposal I would say we we were thinking of then why not just use this consortium of contacts and offer something or let's say an organizational platform that would connect them together, but more or less formalize as well the outcomes of these meetings. So there are three things we thought we can uh, help in. And again, it's, it's simply a proposal at this stage, but we've started taking active steps is to um, enhance the organizational capacity of some of the ongoing meetings that are already taking place. Ensure that there's more linkage between these conversations that happen, these meetings that happen and the government. So 
we can encourage more bilateral policy exchanges within the MPS arm, so coordinate the meetings, make sure that there's a standard agenda, standard format, expand the group if anyone suggests that there's someone else who should also join the group, that they, they're more than welcome, if obviously they're relevant, provide some operational support, document some of these policy discussions. And again, the main issue is usually that a lot of these meetings have a lot of interesting outcomes that are not necessarily documented, and thus they end up not really being communicated directly to the government. So perhaps that's one way to, again, just enhance the capacity of an existing network and making sure that whatever the outcome of these discussions are actually communicated. And one other thing which, which we started actually working on is the MPS quarterly seminar. So we also suggested this quarterly seminar. Again, the seminar can be simply um, an avenue for the DPG group or for the members I mentioned here to publicly share their internal findings, a platform that we would we can do like a, um, we do usually like a public event, bringing in different speakers from the government, from the private sector, uh, from academia, what have you, and we bring them together to discuss a specific topic. Obviously here this becomes, since anyone is welcome to attend, then this becomes a very interesting public debate, debate in itself. And again, we can utilize this platform to disseminate new research or communicate new research or talk about a topic, uh, the most recent, I would say, challenge or, or policy challenge that we have. So next slide. So again, as I said, we already started taking some steps and we actually just launched the Egypt NPS seminar uh, in June 28th. So we did our first seminar with uh, within the group and we also publicly announced it. And again, the, the, first, uh, the first seminar was on, um, was basically under the launch, under the umbrella of the launch. We wanted to talk about the global food crisis and the one CGIR response. But not only that, we're not stopping here. We're still having another seminar in October. And again, it will be mainly relevant to what's coming up in November. So in November, there's everyone knows there's COP27 coming. So we thought it would be very interesting and equally, I would say, supportive to discuss Egypt's plans for COP27. So we thought of building a pre-COP27 event that's coming up in October. And again, there's also an event that would come up on wheat amid the Russian-Ukraine crisis. So we're making sure that these seminars happen regularly enough. And obviously what we do is that we make sure that we note take everything that happens during the event, we publicize it, we promote it, we try as much as possible to communicate it back to the government in hope that again, these conversations are actually um, available in an, in an open and a knowledge hub source for anyone to utilize in any meeting. So yeah, I think that's it. And it's, uh, we're really looking forward in this meeting to get more ideas and thoughts from you of what you think are the best suggestions to utilize the capacities of, of the networks we already have. And uh, thank you. Back to you, Michael. Ah, excellent. Thanks a lot, Fatma. That was really, really, really good. And if there are a couple of questions in the chat, if you could answer those, uh, that would be great. And if anyone has any other uh, questions, just put them in the chat and Fatma can answer those as she uh, goes on. So uh, thanks very much. And again, we're going to go on to the next presentation, uh, which is a bit of an innovation. And I think they just tested uh, this the first hackathon in Colombia. So uh, this is, again, an emergent kind of uh, innovation. And good to get some feedback. If people in the chat have any good uh, ideas of how they've involved the youth or the next generation of researchers would be to share here. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan uh, Mokshel, uh, who is a researcher at uh, the Alliance for uh, Bio Biodiversity and SEAT. Uh, and he'll be talking about these hackathons. So over to you, Jonathan. Great, thank you, Michael, and happy to have everyone on board. So policy hackathons, when you hear this, what comes to your mind? Next slide, please. We have a number of global challenges that are affecting the food system now, and this global challenges is taking us off our path to achieving the sustainable development goals. And one of the key challenges that we have here um, which comes in what I call the three C's, is COVID, climate crisis, and conflict, with ripple effects on food prices, on fertilizer prices, affecting productivity in different countries. So what we see here is a big challenge. And with this challenge, it's uh, just these three. It's not one that just one sector ministry can just focus on and have solutions to. So at the end of the day, we do have these challenges, but then we don't have 
a unit that is fit for purpose in terms of generating policy coherence, having policy issues that are critical for the countries and addressing these challenges in a way that is coherent. So we have very uncoordinated and siloed ministries in many countries on the ground and affecting the implementation of policy programs. And sometimes we have the programs, but they are never implemented because it's very uncoordinated. So the policy hackathons emerge from the need to make agri-food systems more productive, uh, resilient, and at the same time, also very responsive to addressing the current needs and future shocks. Next slide, please. And the key thing here is that we want to have a collaborative space and this collaborative space should be one that is able to solve and address the current challenges that we have within the food system not only at the country level, but also connecting both the rural base and other units within the country. And with this collaborative space, the difference is that it's able to bring about the different actors who are involved in policy making, but at the same time also equip them with the tools that they need for achieving the goals that we want to um, achieve with regards to responding to crisis and shocks and the goal is to formulate innovative policies, and those innovative policies will be one that addresses the current challenges, but also engage the existing community of policy practices, uh, both regional and national, for example, RISACs, with key tools for generating policies that fit into national policy making processes. And we have an innovative toolkit called the National Policies and Strategies Toolkit, which is aimed at equipping policymakers with the tools, but at the same time also see how to bring the different actors together to boost policy coherence. We also want to respond to the crisis in a way that is consistent within what is happening in each country and each policy domain. So for it to be very much demand-led and country-led and national policies that aim at addressing specific issues within the country. Next slide, please. So in selecting our participants, we have focus on the actors who are involved in government ministries, um, agencies, also policy think tanks uh, involved in producing evidence based for the countries and research institutions. And we want to select participants who are involved directly in national policy processes and strategies, but also have um, a focus on the youth who are involved in providing analysis for feeding into national development plans within the countries. And we'll have nominations, and these nominations will be further vetted by the policy hackathon team. And two things will be very critical to be involved within the policy hackathon. One is the level of policy engagement by the actors, and number two, interest in policy processes and political economy tools from parking national policies. Next slide, please. So we'll select and um, invite key people, and based on that, we'll form teams for them to engage in a collaborative policy learning space for a three-day hybrid event. And the COP will be one of the key partners in terms of a network base to have participants involved in a policy hackathon. And also for the policy actors to be able to use the existing tools and database that we'll have for developing specific policies that addresses the needs that we are looking into. But then the policies would also consider all areas within the policy cycle with regards to agenda setting, uh, policy formulation, and looking into outcomes and policy impact, both at the national and regional level. And the goal is to have not just narratives, but evidence based that is based on um, concrete analysis and also packaged in a way that is acceptable to the policy makers and policy champions within the countries. Next slide, please. And further, we want to have first five key areas within the hackathon. Number one is to identify the crisis. And with this, we want to look into specific issues that relate to food price increase, for example, climate, smart agricultural adaptation practices or agroecological practices water management practices, land issues, and benchmark these issues. Then prioritize in the next phase, see what's important, have a portfolio of issues that are critical at the national level, use the P 
political economy analysis tool to generate the evidence, evaluate the issues with regards to the relevance of the social economic and also the risks that are involved, the political risks, and see the scalability of these um, policies. And finally, to be able to have these policy poli solutions packaged in a way that meets the needs at the national level. Next slide, please. So here, the communication part is key. And finally, we want to be able to have these policies in Colombia, Kenya, Nigeria, and India, but also build a network of actors which helps to engage South-South or North-South or regionally within the countries and be able to talk to each other and involve the youth. At the end of the day, this should be demand-led, national-led, and also holistic in a way that solves policy problems. And still, we want to learn and see what is working where, when, why, and how. So we hope to engage all of you um, within the policy hackathons and also looking forward to sharing experiences with you. Thank you. Great, Jonathan, that was really nice. And again, uh, any comments or thoughts, any experiences on engaging the youth or policy hackathons, please put into the uh, chat. It'd be great to hear from others. Uh, there is a something in the chat for you, Jonathan, about uh, the toolkit and you know if you can share that or if there's parts of it you can share so you can get to that. But really quickly before we move into the panel, let's just reflect a little bit. And again, what resonates with you? What did you see? What did you agree with? What did you learn? What was surprising? What don't you agree with? Or you have further questions? Just type it into the chat uh, and then I'll tell you when to press return. So 30 seconds. Just think about what you've heard in the last three presentations. And uh, I'll give you 20, 30 seconds, and then you can, we'll press return. I'll tell you when to press return. Great, okay, let's uh, press return now. Let's see what people have. Let's see what people have said. Policy hackathons sound like policy hackers. Maybe you can talk about that, Godfrey, in your reflections. That's a great one. Uh, you know, I'd like to know more about the youth voices. How do we get that up there? Uh, networking, relationships among countries, great. Any other thoughts? Targeting youth. This all sounds expensive. Where can you find the funding for initiatives like this? Great question. Great questions. Are they sustainable? Are they self self sustainable, or do we need a lot of outside work? Uh, building cooperations in times of crisis. I think someone had mentioned that before. Working collectively, than rather than uh, individually, collectively working. Um, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, the voice of the youth. Excellent. So really, again, some good resonation. And I hope uh, we're going to move on to the next part, which is the panel discussion. Uh, and again, I hope some of the panelists can kind of see what some of the thoughts are here and, uh, and, and add on to that. So that with this, I'd like to, uh, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Joyce Maru, uh, who is the senior program coordinator at the uh, uh, at SIP, uh, to she will be the moderator for the panel and bring and introduce all the panelists. So over to you, Joyce. Thank you, Michael. And um, I want to welcome our panelists. We have quite an exciting group of panelists to lead us into the next session, which will be more taking a deep dive and looking at experiences from the different stakeholders because it's all well and good to have the uh, guiding principles, but in practice, we want to know what happens in practice. So I will request the panelists to maybe have their cameras on if they're comfortable with that as I introduce them. So we have a panelist from India, Ganesh Nilam, who is the Executive Director, Collectives for Integrated Livelihood Initiatives. Welcome, Ganesh. Uh, we have Ibrahim Mohammed. Assistant Director, Policy Department of Planning and Policy Coordination 
at the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Abuja, Nigeria. Welcome, Mohamed. Good to see you. And then we have Zaya Celestine. Uh, she's the Secretary General Agriculture Policy Research Network, APRNet, Nigeria. Is Celestine with us? I hope she's here. Welcome to the panel. And uh, we have we have um, Ahmed Mukta, who is a senior economist at FAO Regional Office for Near East and North Africa. Welcome, Ahmed. And we have Chan, Sam Chan Samone, who is Deputy Director General, National Agriculture and Forestry Research Institute at Laos. And we have Te Sen Fashan, a policy expert. Uh, pardon me if I don't pronounce your name very well, but I've tried, I'm sure. So welcome to this discussion. And uh, we will take a first round of questions, which will mainly focus about experiences from you at country level. So I will start with Ganesh and ask you a question around um, the civil society. So what in your experience should be the role of civil society in policy working group and how can we better target them or get more, get them more involved? Thanks, thanks Joyce for, for the question and thanks for the invitation to be part of this. Uh, very important discussion, uh, which will help uh, frame some of important policies at different country level, uh, especially India, if you if you look at. Uh, so, so from a civil society perspective, Joyce, uh, what I strongly feel, civil society, because it is directly connected with the communities on the ground, they, they are looking at programs which get implemented on the ground, and they, they understand the voices of the communities. Uh, that's the most important piece i think civil society can contribute uh, to groups like this uh, to to see because policies have to be framed uh, from the community perspective as well otherwise just framing policies in air would not help uh, to see the change or the impact on the ground and that's where i think importantly the civil society can play a role uh, bring in those voices uh, from the community side do those experiments with the communities on the ground see how the the experiments are actually impacting the communities uh, in the field, uh, be it on the food uh, systems perspective, and bring them to the to the larger policies in a more uh, focused uh, effort uh, to look at. Within India, uh, there are some consortiums uh, who are trying to do this, uh, like the millet mission uh, that we have in India. The government of India is now proactively looking at how millet would be one superfood uh, which would get included uh, within the food basket. So it gets included in the public distribution system. And that's where civil society has played a very important role on bringing such important elements to the policy and see how policy actually adopts it and actions it uh, from, from a long-term uh, engagement perspective. So that broadly, I would say, Josh, uh, the important uh, vertical contribution civil society can bring uh, to, to, such a, to such a platform or a, uh, or a consortium. Okay, thank you, Nilam. Just as a follow-up, what do you think hinders them most of the time from getting effectively involved in some of these discussions? Is, this, is it an element of lack of trust or what do you think is the challenge here? So, unfortunately, what has happened, Joyce, is there is a big difference uh, of understanding between the, between the policy guys, be the bureaucrats or the politicians, and, and the way the civil society works. The, the feeling is that the civil society guys are mostly in an activist more and and the policy guys feel they 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 do not want to basically engage closely from seeing how the benefit uh, try to adopt this in a more between the two uh, two players and it is very important to build the I think there is a bit of a challenge with your audio, but yeah. And I think for trust, I think platforms like COP would be very important. So you're able to hear me now. Hello. Hello. Joyce, you're able to hear me? 
now we can hear you. We are having a challenge. You are breaking a bit, but we can always. Sorry, come sorry. Back. Maybe I'll come back again, Joyce. You can uh, get, get to the next panelist. I'll, I'll surely come back. I'll improve the network and come back. Okay, thank you for sorry that. So we, we will move over to Nigeria. Um, I see like uh, Mohammed was online. Uh, Mohammed, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. So we, we can take a question. Uh, from Nigeria uh, with you sharing a bit of your experience of what you think is the role of these communities of policy practice in Nigeria and what are the expectations and the policy priorities? I think it's a loaded question. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for yeah. giving me the opportunity to join this session. From Nigeria, let me put it or record that in March 24th uh, this year, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development inaugurated the community of practice in the country. And for the first time, we are having that kind of platform to share experience across the country as it affects agricultural development. We all know that in Nigeria, we have a single national fora that got together all relevant stakeholders in the agri sector, which we normally meet once in a year. That forum will share ideas and provide policy options for the authority in the country to look at for sustainable agricultural development. But over the years, we noticed that that single fora, which we call the National Council on Agriculture and Rural Development, is not enough for us to uh, harvest all the happenings and issues around the agricultural sector. Noting that in recent time, we have a lot of emerging issues, be it outbreak of some pests and diseases affecting our major crop commodities. And of course, the issue of prices of agricultural input that required urgent attention at national, state, and even local government level. So in our own part, this COV community of practice that was established can meet on a regular basis. And the chair of that COV is one of the Honorable Commissioner of Agriculture and Natural Resources in one of the 36 states of Nigeria, who happened to also be the Deputy Governor of Kano State. So he discovered that the area of stakeholders involve all the state commissioners of agriculture, fisheries, and livestock as well as private development partners, research institutes, farmers organization, as well as civil society organization. For us, COV, we took it as one of the vehicle that will drive agricultural transformation in Nigeria. And very soon before end of the year, we are going to convene uh, another meeting where we engage all the relevant stakeholders to discuss issues of the outbreak of diseases, issues of food commodities, high prices on food commodities, as well as high cost of uh, farm input, which invariably we attributed all these factors to issue of um, uh, climate change, issue of um, the recent you see, uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis, as well as uh, non-adoption of uh, best practice in our agricultural uh, practices. I believe COV is the way to go. And uh, we look forward to see how we can utilize the platform to at every point in time, engage all our stakeholders to look at a common goal for a better
So thanks, Mohammed. We also seem to lose you towards the end, but we, we got the gist of your message that uh, it's an emerging uh, concept. It's currently been established and it will involve uh, quite a lot of stakeholders and uh, the fact that it's also driven by the government at state level. We hope that it will be successful, but we'll come back to you when you are online. Uh, thank you for sharing those experiences so far. So um, let's move over to Egypt and uh, I will ask a question to Ahmed and, and ask you in Egypt, already Padma shared with us quite a lot that's already going on, but what works and what doesn't work? Yeah, very good afternoon and uh, probably yeah. evening for some of the colleagues. Thanks, Joyce. And yes. thank you to colleagues uh, for inviting uh, uh, to this interesting discussion. Uh, Fatma has already mentioned about the Egypt and since I work uh, at the regional level, allow me to share some of the regional insights. In fact, you know, everything works, but actually it doesn't work. Um, the thing is that uh, we all know what works, but do we implement that? That is the question. And I think that was the reason when we established um, this regional network of experts that Fatma introduced on agriculture trade, where we gathered people of what we call a true multi-stakeholder platform to basically bring the new ideas because somehow we have gone to the level where we are not really democratic when it comes to the policy making process. Um, and even, you know, we have sort of outsourced the thinking to bureaucrats. Um, of course, the bureaucrats are fantastic everywhere, uh, but uh, the fresh ideas could come from anywhere. So by the, I mean, in order to um, have this fresh inflow of the ideas, these type of communities of practice, if you can call it this regional network expert, um, we gathered people from academia, from government as well, by the way, there are a lot of government representatives, um, uh, research, civil society and development sector, but in their individual capacities, come up on some issue, um, reflect upon that, and then come up with some of the solutions. Recently, we launched a communique on the role of trade for food security. Now that communique, of course, is uh, introduced in the individual capacities of the expert, but it gives you some ideas. It gives you a pathway that many of the governments could adopt and you know, um, go ahead with that. So this type of, um, how do we say, open thinking or crowd thinking, as we say, uh, crowd brainstorming, as it was mentioned uh, at the start of this session, is really proving helpful. Now, in case of Egypt, I do not have much of the country level experience, but you know, in, in many of the countries in our region, as I said, what we need and what works is to have a continuous flow of the ideas, not to restrict these policy pipelines only to the public sector, but keep it open for any of the fresh flows of ideas from the private sector as well. Not only for, by the way, brainstorming for the policy making process, but most importantly for the implementation of that policy and strategy as well, uh, depending you know, what, what we mean by that, because sometimes it is the regulatory aspect of the policy, the other side it is more advocacy and awareness. So once we keep these pipelines open, we can be sure that you know, it would be a symbiotic process that benefits both the public sector, private sector, and the society at large. Now, how do we keep these options flow? I think this, uh, the, the very sense of this session to, to establish the communities of practice in variable geometry, if I can use this wording, um, where we have different representations, where we have different mandates, and we have, where we have different outputs as well. So that if one mandate or one output is not suitable or suited for a certain set of policy makers or policy implementers, the other would be. So uh, the, the, the final word is that uh, keep things open, fluid, innovative, and working. And that is what actually works. I'll stop here for the first question. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ahmed. But yeah, so we need to be fluid. We need to be more inclusive. Uh, but, and most importantly, to be even be more serious with the implementation, the follow-up beyond the talking. But uh, just so up, Follow, quick follow-up question in terms of inclusivity and from your experience, have you had uh, maybe farmers or consumers or end users involved in this generation of ideas or co-creation of ideas and policies? Well, 
Certainly, mm -hmm. that's a good question, Joyce. I mean, yeah. not for this platform per se, of course, uh, when we say, let's say um, some of the CGIR colleagues are part of that uh, consortium. And of course, we know that uh, if pre, let's say, bring some of the ideas from that community, we have a couple of people from civil society. It is open as a matter of fact, but we have other configurations that we did at the regional level where we involved farmers. For example, recently we had the uh, international uh, ICF, uh, I forgot, what, I mean, a big, you know, forum um, uh, held by Egypt, you know, on the development sector. In our session on food security, we actually brought actual farmers over there and speak in the same sessions or same stage where we had people from the World Bank, the UN system and finance ministries and so on and so forth. So yes, I mean, it is happening and it really gives them a lot of confidence. And even if it might sound very, you know, basic or simple, by the very fact of involving them in this process actually gives a very different meaning to the policy inclusivity, as you mentioned. Um, we know that you know, the policy making process is quite relatively insulated when it comes to the inclusion of you know, certain segments, but every government in its own right, as you know, have their own processes, have their own um, uh, uh, in inclusive or inclusivity policies as well. But the development sector and people like us, what we can do is that we can, add to the platforms, to the voices, to bring you know, those uh, mar uh, relatively marginalized groups um, into these uh, mainstream policy discussions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. We are moving along very well, but I want to now bring in some experiences from Laos and I will start with you, Chan Samone. I hope I am pronouncing your name very well, but uh, as the co-chair to the subsector working group on agrobiodiversity, can you share with us some lessons in how the group has used research to translate into policy action or to inform policy? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, it's good uh, morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all of you. And I'm, I'm very happy and thank you for organizer to invite me to join this uh, panel discussion to sharing about the uh, um, uh, agro biodiversity subsector working group in Lao PDR. Usually in our ministry, we have uh, about five sec subsector working group. The first one, uh, agro biodiversity, and the second one, forestry, and the third one, irrigation, and the fourth is agri-business, and the last one is rural development. On each sector, subsector working group have to report to the sector work, working group on ARD, agriculture and rural development, and the ministry. Um, in our experience, in the first term, we start early in the year 2000. 2001, uh, 2000, we are developed the um, um, uh, national biodiversity and action plan uh, among the, the partner in uh, Lao PDR and also development partner and also the sector to develop the first one. And they are going to complete on 2015. From uh, 2016 until now, we are uh, implementing the, the second, uh, we call NEP2. NEP2 is a queen uh, from 2016 to 2025, almost 10 years. Right. And um, in for participants of the, this working subsector working group, we are invite on the stakeholder like yeah, research institute from uh, our ministry and also from other ministry and also the National uh, University of Lao, the Faculty of uh, Agriculture, Faculty of Forestry, and also Faculty of Environment to join this working group. And uh, another one is uh, NGO, uh, NGO who work on uh, agrobiosity, also one of our uh, member. And uh, private sector is very important because private sector, they have a lot of uh, using on uh, biodiversity species. And the last one, maybe civil society. 
uh, who are working on agrobiosity also to, to, to join this project. From um, uh, development partner, the, main, the key development partner is uh, FAO, who are support a lot of uh, like capacity building and also SDC, uh, the, the, the SDC and also the um, some um, biodiversity. Now they are also a member of uh, CTIA, also support for us. Um, we are using this uh, platform, we inform to sub-sector uh, working group every six months to report uh, from each partner and each uh, participant. They are working on uh, agri uh, agrobiosity to, uh, to uh, report to the uh, sector working group. The sector working group is a leader by the Y minister, sometimes minister to, to be the chair with FAO and also other partner like EU, the key, key event partner at the top. And from uh, East product, uh, East product we are developed on most uh, concept node and to do the what policy we are going to work on uh, agriculture product with uh, in the digital uh, Natural, natural product and also and productivity and also some uh, uh, environment issue concerning on agro biodiversity for area. What area we are working on and what specific uh, product what we are working on, what the situation we are working on. This one. Uh, do my research and support to uh, policy maker. We are by making the policy brief and uh, maybe next speaker, next uh, panelist, Seng Pachan will be talking more about this because this is more experience on policy. Oh, for uh, my maybe stop like this and if you have any questions, maybe you can ask me the question. Thank you for sharing. It sounds like a very well organized, coordinated group with, yeah. of course, tangible outcomes. And just very quickly, one minute, I would like you to share with us what you, you have come across as could be a challenge, especially for ensuring sustainability. There was a, a question on the chat in terms of how do we ensure that these communities of policy practice are not only fueled by project and funding and then after the project phase out, then they are no longer there. So what would you share uh, from your experience, please? Uh, before choosing some uh, product, we are doing the, uh, we can uh, start from participatory. Uh, we can uh, farupam by planning on uh, agro-ecology planning from the bottom up. They are to select the, the, the product. And, and the participant also form the local community to work on that. And also district forestry and agriculture officer to join. And also we invite on the private sector. They are working business around that area to, to join. After the project uh, finished, they can the local community can continue by by themselves to develop the product into domestic market and also into international and regional market. This is the the what we are learning from the uh, previous uh, app. Great, thank you. So involving the private sector, local communities, and building it up bottom up approach. Thank you for sharing those uh, very useful insights. So last but not least, I'll come to you, Shang. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to continue sharing experiences from Laos, uh, you have worked for many years coordinating the Lao policy think tank. And, okay, I'm putting you on the spot, tell us what happened to it. 
what were its successes and lessons learned for future policy groups? Or maybe it's still there. You can tell us it still exists. So over to you. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Dr. Chan Simons, uh, to highlight uh, uh, some uh, experience uh, in Laos. Uh, I would uh, focusing on the uh, my support uh, for the policy think tanks. I would start uh, with the need. Uh, I, I think it start with uh, the needs and willingness. Uh, the senior government officials, uh, I remember at that time at the uh, Y minister levels and minister and also concerns organizations, business enterprise were interested in policy formulations based on science and evidence-based research to support the policy formulation process. And in 2012, the policy think tanks was established and led by the National uh, Agriculture and Forestry Research Institutes, or we call NAFRIS, that uh, Dr. Jan Smon is leading, which is under the Ministries of Agriculture and Forestry. And that term is uh, lots of questions and also uh, uh, challenge in terms of establishments of policy think tanks, because you, you may be uh, familiar with policy think tank is an autonomous uh, organization or entity, which is usually uh, operate outside uh, the government's uh, institutes. But uh, in this case, uh, uh, the policy maker thinks that it should be organized within uh, uh, the frame of uh, the government or so under ministry of agriculture and forestry. Of course, the aim of the policy think tank is to engage uh, government ministries, private sectors, and other relevant stakeholders in dialogue and consensus buildings uh, to address critical national policy issues and impact uh, actions uh, uh, at the provincials and district level uh, to support uh, the improvements of livelihoods among the rural poor. That's the, uh, the aim of the policy think tanks. And then uh, moving on to uh, what would be the lessons, what happens, I would uh, summarize uh, in, in some uh, a uh, key area that uh, I would um, emphasize the importance of networking of researcher and expert to generate evidence. In one way is to avoid duplications uh, in terms of conducting research. On other hand, we can also, uh, uh, how to say, bring uh, expertise and, ex uh, and research finding from uh, through the network as well. Secondly, I would uh, emphasize on the commitment and support from senior officers or policy maker and relevant organization, including donors. And uh, we, we, we can also, uh, uh, chat as well as, as Joyce uh, also asked Dr. Jan Smon in terms of sustainability of this kind of uh, uh, platform or group. Third, I would uh, emphasize on knowledge broker or I call matchmaker between uh, policy maker and researcher. This is uh, uh, in order to meet the need and knowledge gap of the policy maker. One way we try to address is uh, to have a clear research agenda, but we can also share as well when you uh, develop the research agenda and some emerging issue can come up all the time, which is uh, the researcher and policy think tank have to uh, try to uh, fill the gap, the knowledge gap of the policy maker. More important, uh, we can't avoid institutional chains and stop movement or stop rotations. Uh, that is common in Lao PDR, especially within the government, right? Uh, 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 
within the government institutes. That's why there is a need uh, for institutional memories uh, and uh, on policy uh, practice and mechanism that we establish to inform and strengthen knowledge of new generations. I would emphasize both uh, researchers and policy maker. And as, uh, as uh, we, we heard from previous uh, presentations, we should also focusing on youth, but I focus on the new generation, whether new generations of policy maker or the researcher. That uh, I will stop from there, just uh, some of uh, the starting up of the policy think tanks and uh, some key lessons that I want to highlight here. You may have a uh, uh, follow up uh, question from that. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you so much. That's really insightful. I like your point around the knowledge brokering, but also the role of science and evidence in terms of informing uh, policy and of course I think as research organization that is where we come in strongly to say what kind of evidence is relevant and then how can we break it down and make sure that the policy maker can understand it or can consume it and, and apply it on the ground so really really want to thank you on that the problem is we would like to even go deeper in some of the issues that you raised there but time is against us so what I'll do is to just go around and ask all the panelists to give us a, a final message in terms of COPs, establishing communities of policy practice in your country or in the region. What would be your best bet uh, in terms of some of the building blocks that will make it work? So we can start with Ganesh. Are you still there, please? Give us um, just your parting shot. Sorry, my internet is a bit unstable, so I'm putting the video off. Yeah. We can so, Joyce, you. I think, yeah. So Joyce, I think uh, the most important piece uh, for, for us and looking at the Indian context is to get these like-minded players together, uh, mainly from the research fraternity, uh, from the civil society, uh, from the policies uh, together. Uh, it's very important. And, and to do that, uh, some steps that can be taken are at least players like us from the civil society can be more proactive on getting these stakeholders together. Uh, it would take a lot of effort and time, but it is, I suppose, the most important piece uh, to do. And we'll maybe get some philanthropies also to join hands, which can enable uh, the other stakeholders to come in and actually engage and work on this. So that's broadly I would put across uh, from my side. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, what about Abraham? Are you still there, please, Mohammed? Okay, he seems to have dropped off. So let's hear from Ahmad. What's your key message to us and or to Egypt Corps as they continue to establish and, 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 and become stronger? Yes, certainly, Joyce. I would say that um, the key is to keep engaged and keep these uh, platforms open, inclusive, and efficient as well in terms of you know coming up with some of the knowledge products or contributions that would really help shaping the policy environment. Um, I would emphasize on the diversity and inclusion in these platforms so that the ideas do not stagnate. Rather, we come up with the fresh ideas and fresh ways of thinking so that there is a better adaptability amongst the stakeholders. Thank you. Great, thank you. So, Chan Samone, please. So my comment, my final comment is uh, policy when we work with uh, many stakeholders uh, to make, we have to make easy one. We use uh, the word, very easy word, simple word to everybody understand and understood and they can continue and they can follow up. This is uh, the way how to do the policy in uh, from researcher to and policy and policy maker have to understood the stakeholder. Thank you. Great, thank uh, you. Jo Joyce, may I? Yeah. I'm really sorry, but I like yeah. his point very well. Yeah. There yeah. is a lot of semantic noise in the policy circles. We need to remove that. 
what happens actually, and I'm being very blunt over here, uh, many of the players in our fraternity in the development sector come up with new terminologies and new concepts because we feel pride in that, which are completely alienated from people who want a simple language. You know, we, we come up with economic, I'm, I'm an economist myself, econometric models, new so-called, you know, terminologies and the buy-ins and the agencies and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't think that, I mean, we, we need to be in the shoes of a person who actually designs and implements the policy. What would be more feasible for him or her? Sorry for intervention, thank you. No, that's, that's a great uh, addition right there. We have to know how to package the message and to make it simple to be understood because when they see our research language and publication, everybody gets scared. So that is a really great challenge. And I suppose that these COPs will become one of the tools to enable us to have discussions that are more simplified and understood by stakeholders. So last but not least, Sheng, I want to make have a twist to your question instead of asking you to give us a takeaway is to tell us how can we move, involve women? How can we take care of issues around gender when we are establishing these communities of policy practice? Yes. Um... Uh, before that, uh, I just want to highlight uh, that uh, Alan uh, is, uh, how to say, present those on the uh, principles that uh, the principle in terms of uh, uh, using existing platform, uh, that uh, is part of uh, what uh, also I mentioned about the networking, which is avoid some duplication, some initiative that uh, have been taken. And another part that you are uh, you are interested in uh, in uh, bringing women's race and that uh, or gender uh, in terms of policy that uh, I have been uh, doing a lot uh, throughout the developments and and addressing uh, some of the issue. And women is also. Uh, they need some, uh, how to say, you have to make sure that they are comfortable in what kind of platform that we already share. I think some of the speaker already highlights that uh, even farmer, right? A farmer, also the women, and I work with the uh, uh, farmer women a lot. Then the way to get their message is not only bringing them to the platform, so-called official platform. We can go down and sit with them where they comfortable and make them feel comfortable to share. And that uh, I would highlight. And I think that some of the initiative that uh, uh, how uh, that uh, we uh, have greater involvement of women. That's, uh, I would uh, stop from there, Joyce. Uh, we can find some time to uh, share more insights uh, in terms of uh, even case study or case by case. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We'll definitely follow up with each and every one of you to take a, a, di a, a deep dive and you know, follow up on some of these issues, even as we continue to work at country level. Um, so I wish to stop this panel discussion here just because of time and, and thank you so much for your insight and making time to come and share your knowledge with us. So um, we want to end this session here and thank you so much. And over to uh, you, Joyce. Michael, or should I proceed yeah. to the next one? Well, so let's, uh, I, I, and I just want to apologize to Celestine. Yeah. I, we weren't yeah. sure who, who was it, what her name was in the uh, or Celestine's name from uh, from Appernet. So could you just uh, Celestine, do you just want to do a like just two minutes and kind of introduce and kind of some of your key points and lessons and takeaways? We want to give you a chance to talk as well, but just two or three minutes quickly. Thank you. Yeah. And sorry for yes. that. <laughs> Celestine, you're breaking. We can we can't hear your audio. Yeah, sorry, we can't hear you.
Okay, so I think that we can come back to Celestine if we have time at the end. And again, our apologies even for not recognizing that you're online and, um, and the, the, the challenges with the, with the network. So we, we have come to the end of the panel discussion. I think we can move on to the next session, Michael. And uh, the next session is just uh, hearing some reactions from some of our experts that are on. So we have uh, one of our experts who is Enrique uh, Mendizabal, founder and director on Think Tanks. And we have Dr. Godfrey Bahigua, who is the Director of Rural Economy and Agriculture Department at the African Union. So we want to welcome them to the event and ask them to take maybe about three to four minutes to give us their reaction and their takeaway from the discussion so far, and even some of their insights that may not have been mentioned. So we start with you, Godfrey, welcome. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Joyce, and um, I thank the organizers for um, bringing on board the African Union and uh, myself to, to give some reflections. Uh, I also thank the, the panelists, where the, first of all, the, 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 the setters of the scene, uh, but also the, the in-depth uh, um, contributions by the various uh, uh, panelists. So what have I picked from this, uh, from listening to um, all these speakers? So the first one is there is no common understanding of what a common uh, a, 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 a community of practice is, of policy practice. I think there is a diversity of um, understanding. And I think it was one participant from Egypt, Fatima, who tried to give um, a cohesive definition of what she thought a, a, a community of practice, uh, policy practice is. The others went uh, deep uh, into it without offering a definition. But I think at some point it would be nice to give uh, maybe two, three definitions because um, perhaps not one definition would be sufficient uh, given the diversity of the uh, communities of practice that we have had at different levels. So that's one observation. Um, the second observation is um, around the, the principles that were presented by Alan. I think by and large, I agree with them um, because in practice, that's what you, you tend to see, especially for functional communities of practice. I only um, perhaps would uh, uh, disagree with one, the one on supporting uh, from behind is not always the case. So that is that can be very specific to a particular community of practice, but cannot be a general principle because sometimes you actually have to lead from the front if you want to, uh, to, ha to have um, uh, change uh, happen. Um, the other thing that I also uh, picked um, around diversity of the communities of practice, um, they are issue specific, they are context specific, so it's hard to generalize. But also let me uh, perhaps uh, make this statement that um, the concept of communities of practice is not new. Um, I think for, for the CGR uh, uh, people that are doing research, uh, this is not a new concept. Um, you are simply um, putting, uh, you are sanitizing the concept um, around one phrase. But these communities of practice exist in almost every country um, in, different, in different forms. They may be government communities of practice in ministries of agriculture or ministries of finance, or one that brings together different ministries and agencies as the case of Nigeria uh, that was presented, but they do exist and, and, and function differently. They may be by civil society, they may be by private sector. They are given different names. Um, so in the definition, the, 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 the phrase committees of practice, I hope it doesn't catch on as something that is a novel uh, um, rather than a concept that brings together different stake stakeholders to address a particular a particular issue. Now, the form uh, or nature of these COPs um, again varies. You have you have them formal uh, in some cases led by governments, and those tend to have um, perhaps uh, longevity. 
they last longer. The challenge with them is that they tend to be complicated to, uh, to, to, to manage um, because of the politics of the institution that are involved, but they are also politically vulnerable. We have seen uh, communities of practice emerge um, during a particular government, and when that particular government leaves office, they collapse, and then maybe a new, a, a new community of practice, practice emerges. On the other hand, you have the informal ones, um, uh, which, uh, which are organized around maybe uh, sector working groups or um, donor working groups, a, a little more informal, um, but also then they, guess they face the challenge of making inroads into the policy making space. Um, yes. Um, the other thing that I had, um, and, 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 and I, liked, I liked it was the idea of keeping the, um, the, the policies, the communities, uh, or the ideas into the communities um, informal and not rigid. Um, in other words, keeping up with the, 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 the times. Um, and I think this was an example was given by, by Ahmad. Uh, I liked it uh, uh, very much. The need for um, having continuous flow of ideas and um, exchanges or knowledge to inform uh, or support decision making or policy implementation. Um, and also, um, I liked his statement around uh, policy making not being a monopoly of civil servants and politicians, but should be something that is uh, inclusive. So, formal COPs, um, more sustainable but politically vulnerable. The informal ones um, are nimble, but face a challenge of um, getting the ideas uh, to, be, uh, to be taken up. Um, also, we have project specific COPs. Uh, they tend to face sustainability challenges. So they are okay function as long as the projects exist, but when the projects um, die, uh, they also tend to die with, with them. So um, in summary, I had uh, things to do with the, the, the diversity of the definition of, of what a COP is, what it does, and so on. And then the COPs being um, purpose specific, uh, and with the diversity of the origins of those um, um, of the issues that are discussed in the in the cops, uh, the nature of the of the cops, formal and informal, um, and project specific. But all in all, what I had is good. That uh, whatever platforms exist, the the intentions are good. They tend to want to um, uh, bring about change, whether it is uh, around a policy idea or um, implementing a project at a community, bringing together people to discuss how best to, to, bring, uh, to bring positive results or positive change is for me the key message um, around why um, the, the, policy, the communities of practice exist and why they will continue to be uh, important in a driving around um, um, policy process changes or uh, trying to improve uh, project and program implementation. So with that, Back to you, Joyce. Thank you so much, Godfrey. That's a great synthesis of the discussion. I think that I don't need to take notes. I have all the points already from you, but uh, let's bring in then Enrique to see that whether he can strengthen that or bring a different point of view from your synthesis, Godfrey. So welcome, Enrique. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, everybody. Um, just checking you can hear me. This is a really interesting discussion, very hard to try to synthesize because as uh, Godfrey was saying, the definition is, uh, is unclear, but that's, that's fine. I think um, there are going to be um, particularities in sectors in context that it mean that we need a much more open, open definition or description of what we mean about communities, policy communities of practice. This is also not a new thing, as Godfrey just said, um, and, and I think that's interesting because it also makes us think about whether the model is, is as relevant now as it was before. So let me try to emphasize a few points already made and try to add a new one in my, in my brief intervention uh, on a subject that I, <laughs> I'm very interested in and, and, and hope to learn a lot more. 
the first point I think is important is to emphasize the existence, right, of policy communities or practice or policy communities. Um, I think all too often uh, international cooperation partners tend to make the assumption that there's nothing there and that they're coming in to build. So I think one of the comments I made in the chat is that maybe the, the phrase is strengthening communities rather than building communities. But I think the key thing is to identify the informal communities, the, the, those that cannot be clearly recognized, uh, because those are the ones that tend to be the tighter and the most resilient ones. And they're not connected necessarily by official titles. They're connected by links of kinship, um, alma mater links, professional links, political, ideological, and they tend to be quite diverse, bringing in technocrats and practitioners, as well as researchers, operators, politicians together. Um, these also, I think it's important to identify, recognize that these are not necessarily altruistic communities of practice, right? So even if there are good intentions and there's a public service ethos within them, there are also many motivations for individuals to come together um, around what could be an informal um, community of practice. And rarely they have names, but I think increasingly, at least in the context of Peru, where I, I can say something about um, these communities, policy communities of practice are beginning to name themselves as they try to play a, a more influential role in, in the public space. So we've got some of them in the in the conservative right, we have some of them in the in the left, and we have some of them in the progressive progressive center, with the, which come up with blogs and brands and names as they try to connect more actively. I think they all need strengthening, not necessarily forming. Um, and I'm always a bit worried about formalizing um, spaces like these because uh, they they can they can actually uh, sort of limit creativity and uh, and and dynamism. Another thing that kept, kept, kept coming out, especially in the cases from Egypt, something that these communities of practice tend to be, but I think the panel emphasized they shouldn't be, is the issue of homogeneity, right? So it's, it's much easier to manage a network or a community where everybody is more or less the same. So everybody is a funder, everybody is an expert, everybody is an academic, or everybody is a civil servant, everybody is an NGO activist. It's a lot easier to do that. Uh, I also recognize that often communities of practice are closed space or invited spaces to, uh, to use John Gaventa's power cube. Um, and in practice, um, communities of practice tend to be a particular type of community, right? Where you have to be, you have to have some level of, some minimum level of knowledge or an expertise. One of the participants mentioned this in the, uh, in the chat as well. Right? So, so there is a barrier to entry, but I think the public in general around the world, um, I wonder if you can all agree, is less and less inclined to trust experts, uh, especially if they position themselves uh, superior or special, right? or, or, um, or, or, or for, some, for some reason having the, the right to make decisions on their behalf. So I think the public does not buy the meritocratic myth. And around the world, they're less, less willing to be quiet, to listen, and to be told what to do. And so I, 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 think, I think, although it's, it's easier to manage homogeneity, uh, sorry, homogeneous and closed spaces, it's easy to engage with them. I don't think they're gonna be as effective as, as they used to be. Um, and so we need to think about that diversity, that inclusion that was being um, discussed in the panel more, more and more. Now, I would argue then that there are objectives, there are tasks, maybe when you want to achieve impact at scale, uh, where you want to do it in a sustainable manner that do require these spaces, these sort of structured, somewhat structured, somewhat coordinated spaces. Um, and sometimes those communities do need to be built, right? There, it might be that those who need to work together may not be doing that because they don't know each other, because they don't trust each other, or maybe because they don't have the resources to collaborate. Talking is not cheap, right? Engaging is not cheap. Um, but then the question that comes to my mind is who should be doing this? Who should be the trusted actor, right? Uh, the neutral actor, but we know that nobody's neutral. Um, Anne-Marie Slaughter from New America at one of our conferences talked about think tanks 
transforming into change hubs. So she was calling for think tanks to be those who convene different actors. I might work in some contexts, in some issues, not in others. Universities may be better hosts in some contexts. In the past, the church has played that role as well, when nobody could agree who might be the, the, the more neutral, relatively speaking, more neutral, uh, most trusted actor. International organizations can do it as well. I, as a, as a Peruvian, I often feel that in principle, I want to avoid anything that is not local, uh, but I recognize that, can be, that it can be hard. Um, and then I want to say one more thing, and this is my, my final point, and what I hope is a new, a new point. I think that we've been talking about policy communities of practice primarily as a, as a technocratic tool to, to solve a problem or to advance a policy, right? to, to, to bring about policy change. But I think they can serve other purposes. And I'm going to reflect on the case of, uh, of Peru, which, which I know. So if anybody has been following the news, uh, you would probably find it very hard. So any plans, any plans to influence policy developed last week would have probably be use, useless this week, and so on and so on. So the context is really, really unstable. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that our politics, our systems, you know, is, our politics is broken for sure. There is no middle ground. All three branches of the, of, of the state are captured by mercantilistic interests. There's rampant corruption, there's biased media, um, you know, et cetera. I would argue that in, in, in this case, when it comes to sectorial policymaking or problem solving, the very best we can hope for is keeping things as they are and not letting them fall any deeper, right? Not losing any more experts in key ministries, not, uh, not losing any more public services, you know, but, but I, I would argue that that's actually not going to happen. We're going to continue to slide down, um, you know, into kind of into deeper waters. Um, but this is the best we can get unless we meant our politics, and unless we meant the system on top of which all policymaking happens. And I think we tend to forget that policymaking is one aspect of public policy and politics is is a crucial aspect of it, is, is what sustains the decisions that technocrats and researchers and experts make. So I would argue that policy communities, if they're open, right, if they're inclusive, if they're diverse, if they're participatory, if they can manage that, they can make a contribution towards strengthening our politics, our systems. Their very existence, I would argue, right, the very fact that they exist that they bring people from different walks of life, institutions that might not, might not be communicating otherwise. So that I, the, the fact that they, they have quality and diversity and in participation, even if that not, doesn't lead to policy changes as we understand them, right? new legislation, increasing budget, etc. I think that's a good thing in itself. So I think that's what I would contribute in terms of an additional way of thinking about it. So is to, is to think of their existence and their functioning as a crucial outcome and not just any influence they might have on a policy or a program um, at the national and international level. And I hope that that's an interesting enough contribution to this very interesting and difficult conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. I like the way you and Godfrey have summarized the discussion, but in addition to that, you brought in your own thinking and your own insight that also for me challenges to, us to think outside the initial ideas that we've had. So I think it was really going to enrich us going forward. So I think we've done so well so far and I want to pass this back to Michael. And thank you so much for to Godfrey and Enrique for your time and the insights that you've shared. Over to you, Michael. Yeah, I just I want to thank everybody as well. I think, you know, all the panelists did a great job. We have a lot of lessons and I think a lot of thinking to take back into each of the countries to to really help us kind of speed this up and and make sure that we're building upon what's already there rather than trying to construct something new. So I think all these lessons are, are really valuable. We'd like to, you know, get more people on the bus. That's important for us, I think. So we'll be uh, having, you know, we'll we'll be 
putting out kind of a, a short report and maybe a blog on this. But if you'd like to uh, continue to join us in this journey, you know, put your name in the chat or you can send uh, myself or Joyce an email uh, to get involved. So we're very much, you know, looking forward to getting more people involved and, uh, and really learning. And maybe in another year, we'll have some more learning as well and, and continue this discussion and bring people together. So stay in touch. Uh, with that, Joyce, do you want to kind of close us off? Any last uh, words? Well, I don't want to sound redundant by repeating what you said, but uh, just to say <laughs> we will continue engaging because this is a very important learning space and we'll take away what we had today and what we've been thinking, merge that together, continue to improve and start the work. I think we only learn by doing. So we take this to the field, we implement, and then at some point we get together again and, and discuss the lessons that are emerging. So I will encourage people who would like to be considered in, in this global community to get in touch with us. And also we'll also follow up with you you know, to really get discussing and get learning and, and as we continue. And the intentions are good. I think at the bottom of it is our intention to bring about change and to continue addressing issues as they emerge. As we know, there are so many global challenges that we are all facing. So I want to thank everybody for everything and wish you a good morning, afternoon, evening, good night from wherever you're joining us from. And thank you. Over.